This is Father James Mitchell. No matter what's going on, listen to Wolfie D. You were the new church. You were the bedrock. You were what Bobby Eaton was to Jim Cornette to me. Getting engaged is a moment worth cherishing. A one-of-a-kind ring that you design at Blue Nile can help your love sparkle. Just choose your diamond and setting. When you've found the one, you'll get it delivered right to your door. Finding the right engagement ring can be nerve-wracking. At Blue Nile, you'll have the expert guidance needed and a diamond guarantee that ensures you're getting the highest quality at the best price. Cherish all of life's moments and save up to 30% at BlueNile.com. That's BlueNile.com. Hey, this is Jimmy Street, host of the Live and in Color with Wolfie D podcast. Hear the life and times of professional wrestler Wolfie D. From his time in the territories with PG-13 to his time in WWE, ECW, WCW, TNA, and more. Nothing is off limits and nothing will be held back. Thanks again for tuning in. Here he is, Wolfie D. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a great honor tonight. One of the very best managers of all time, the sinister minister, the purveyor of all things evil, Father James Mitchell. Thank you and welcome to the podcast. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing fine. Thank you, Jimmy, for having me on. And you, Wolfie, my my dear old friend as well. Thanks, Jim. Hey, what we want to talk about tonight, man, is, uh, man, our time in TNA. You know, I had uh, I had watched you before I met you uh, as a, as a younger kid. You're just you're just a little bit older than me, Jim. Not too much older than me, but uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> they put us together in TNA. Uh, that's when me and you really met and got to know each other. Yep. Uh, let's talk about. Uh, you know, the, because I, in my opinion, it was a it was a fluke at first. They 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 kind of put me and you together with, and and you corrected me on Facebook. I thought Brian was my first partner, but you no, said it was no. Flash, and so I I don't you know my my memory's kind of jagged. So let's no. talk about that man. How did how did we get together, and what do you remember about me and? how we got this thing going. Okay. So let me, I'm going to take you way back. So I was out of town on a cruise with my ex-wife, right? And this is when 2002, maybe Mm -hmm. 2002. And I come back and uh, the guy who was house watching for me says, Jim Cornette called you and I'm freaking out. Right. I'm thinking Jim Cornette called me. What the, he's, he worked for WWE at the time. Right. And of course it wasn't Jim Cornette and I couldn't figure out what the fuck it was. Turns out, and I didn't find out until I, I forget who eventually contacted me. I think it was Jeremy Borash, but it turns out it was Bert Prentice who had called me while I was out of town and the guy house sitting for me fucked up and said it was Jim Cornette. So (laughs) Bert was pissed off that I bigfooted him, you know. <laughs> it was like, oh, you don't have time to call me back. So anyhow, um, the initial deal, um, I think I think I spoke to Jeff at first. Uh, I mean, no, Jeremy called me, and then I think at first it was uh, they wanted to put me with Lenny and Lodi, and I said, well, Jeff, um, I don't know how that works, you know. <laughs> Um, not, you know, not that I have any problem with the gay gimmick, but I just, I just, it doesn't, it seems like a weird combination. And, um, then with whatever, with either later that day or a couple of days later, Borash called me up and he said, we have an idea. And he goes, it's going to be, uh, father James Mitchell and the disciple, no, the Lords of the new church, the Lords of the new church was a band from the eighties. Right. Cause I knew that yeah. from working in a record store forever. And I told Borash, uh, I don't think you can do that because I'm pretty sure that name's copyrighted or whatever trademark. So he came back and he said, disciples of the new church. So I said, fine. And, um, I, I had no idea. I mean, when he said, I'm going to put you with slash and, uh, and I don't, I, I think the only one he told me was you. Oh uh, no, he did say the wall, you and the wall who was malice. No. Mouth, um, yeah. Jerry Toot, and um, but I mean, I didn't know you. I mean, I vaguely well, I didn't even know he didn't say Wolfie D, so I had no idea who Slash was. 
In fact, the only slash I knew was some guy from Outlaw Days, like ten years earlier. You know, and I was like, "Oh fuck, what are they doing?" Anyhow, <laughs> um, we we get there, and uh, turns out it was you, Wolfie D, who then yeah, PG thirteen. I remember that, and uh, and I remember the wall. But um, I remember we got there, and you know, thing it, that first night was so crazy, and it's a miracle it even came off. And as you yeah. may recall, during the dark match with the, who was that guy? Cheeks, the, the, the big guy. Yeah. Hit, they, they hit the turnbuckle and the ring collapsed like five minutes before we went live. You know, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah. So the uh, so yeah. I mean, I, I'm about a hundred percent sure I'd never met you before that. Um, so as I recall, they were doing the uh, like the Royal Rumble thing for the. Uh, the title and that was uh 2001 i think that was in uh, I, I think it i think okay. it was june june or july of 2002 i believe was it, it was, I'm, yeah I'm, it was right before i got divorced so i'm pretty sure it was, it was well you might remember that better than yeah that's a good mark yeah i remember it Emma, correct yes yeah, so that's a that's a mile marker but um yeah, so uh yeah, so we went out there and we we did our thing and um I believe I went out there with you first and then uh Malice came out and I, I forget exactly how that worked out, but you know, he he went to the end with uh Shamrock he, into the main and Shamrock wrote a title. But I recall that then that they did you and Malice as a tag team for a few weeks. But yeah. there was an issue with Malice and, and I love the guy, but he was he was a little hard headed. I remember him kind of talking shit to Jeff Jarrett on and off or complaining about things. Um and and he disappeared for a little bit and then they put um Devin Storm with you next, I believe was the yeah, next guy. I remember that and that was at uh that was in Nashville at the uh oh what was that place called? Uh, the asylum? No, no, hold on. That was before we went to the asylum. Exactly, yep. exactly. That was the 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 Coliseum there in Nashville. I can't remember what they called it. Damn it! And I lived there for all my life. I can't. Right, remember but but before they went broke. <laughs> so yeah, so yeah, we, yeah. we did. I don't know five or six weeks of TV. Yeah. As I recall, suddenly, it, anything that wasn't that was had to be flown in that wasn't, you know, Scott Hall or something. Nobody was getting blown in. And, and they went to the, the, uh, the fairgrounds, the, uh, the fairgrounds. And they were suddenly filming everything like on handy cams and shit like that. And, and, you know, there was no production. It, it looked like shit for a few weeks. So I figured we were done. And, um, and I believe maybe, ah, let's see. So we started in, uh, I was gone for a little while, and then Borash called me back. And um, I remember well, it was about the time Belladonna came in. And all that happened at the same time. Um, they called us back. They put together a really cool-looking package, which is one of Borash's great fucking talents, you know. Uh, it may have been uh, – I, I don't remember if he cobbled together shit from when we were there previously – or, or if it, maybe we did it one week and then they put together the big package and gave us the big push. But um, Malice was still around, but he was he was in and out, you know. But um, they put Brian Lee with us, which to me was that was the team, you know. Yep. That yeah. that was the one where it kicked off, and uh, and you know it was still a thing in those days where they were throwing a lot of shit at the wall to seeing what stuck. And I remember at the time, um, we started feuding with uh, America's Most Wanted, yep. uh, James Storm and Chris Harris. Yeah. And and the, the way, as I recall, this was, uh, you know, there'd been maybe a year and a half or so since uh, WCW closed, so there was only WWE. And suddenly we had a bunch of indie guys that nobody had ever really seen before. And so the styles kind of changed, if you know what I mean. Um, yeah. So there was a lot more of the, the flippy, flippy kind of shit. And I remember us getting together with, with America's Most Wanted. 
and and coming up with you know what let's do all these kind of cool false finishes which nobody else was doing at the time you know right and and i remember we we started having these great fucking matches with america's most wanted so i guess that that was probably no november of 2002 or somewhere in there and um we, we had and, and i remember um we started getting over tell me if your memory of this is this one. so at, at the time america's most wanted was there and um people i guess that movie broke back mountain had come out and they started chanting that at them but, you know a storm would come out there broke back mountain or whatever and they're the baby faces and we're the fucking heels and I never tried to be a cool heel because I had right. not long been out of WCW. And I was like, fuck a cool heel. I want people to boo me, right? So right. we went out there, but we were having such good matches. And, um, I mean, if you, if you think about the early days, I mean, people were really into low key. They were into us. And I forget who else they were into. Uh, Ron Killings. But they started yeah. chanting evil. Yeah. Remember that? Yeah. So here we are, heels. And everybody's going, evil, evil, evil. And and we almost, I mean, although we never did anything babyface, we were over like cool heels without trying to be. And I remember telling you one time, because like they started chanting and I remember you getting up on the turnbuckle one time and starting to pump your fist. I'm like, Wolfie, don't do that. We're fucking heels. But but yeah, we, <laughs> we in, in, in that environment, we were over shit and, uh, yeah, we we had some great fucking matches with America's Most Wanted, and uh, and you know, and Brian in there, he was a great, yeah, great fucking yeah. hand, man. Hey, man, um, Brian, you know, I I watched Brian as a kid uh, before I ever got in the business. I remember seeing Brian Lee. Uh, one thing I told him, a story between me and him, uh, I you know from Nashville. And, you know, we taped at the fairgrounds. There used to be this, uh, and you know, that building was built for wrestling. They built that building for wrestling for Goulas. I did not know that. Right. Yeah, that's absolute truth. Uh, they built that building for wrestling. Um, and that's, that's awesome. That's why that building had that, you know, where the, where the, the, the bleachers went bleachers. up to the yeah. side. Right. Like it was like, and, and I'll never forget this is off topic uh topic from TNA but uh in USWA one time we had a cage match there and uh it was during the Smoky Mountain feud and I I had to climb to the top of the cage and I did a front flip through a table and I'll never forget this man because of the way the building set up when I climbed to the top of that cage and I stood up it's like the whole building stood up with me. They all raised to their feet at the exact yeah. point that I was standing on the top of that cage. And, man, I can't tell you how I got goosebumps right now. now well, let me ask you this, Wolf, I because, I mean, I'm sure I asked you. I'm yeah. sure I asked you this, you know, we were burning the midnight oil over the years. But <laughs> what what year did you actually get started in the business? Because the first time I remember hearing of you, was a, a, about the time I was in Smoky Mountain Wrestling, which was ninety three, ninety four. That's when I was about PG thirteen. Yeah. But um, I'm that's is, are those years right? Ninety three, ninety four. No, yeah. I actually uh, Gypsy Joe uh, trained me when I was fifteen years old in nineteen eighty nine. Oh my, shit! So I you got my, started the same year I did. Yeah, <laughs> actually, had, right. the interaction in the ring. When I was 15, it wasn't a match, but I got in a match when I was 15 years old. Uh, then uh, 1990, 1991 is when I started uh, actually wrestling and wrestled with a lot of guys that, like, it was hands-on, man. Uh, George Weingroff, I don't know if you know that name. Yeah, that's uh, uh, is that the guy that was a manager, or am I thinking of Saul Weingroff? Oh, Saul Saul was his dad. George, oh, okay, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, George was his son who was legally blind, and he wrestled <laughs> for he, yeah. he wrestled for uh, the blind school and was a great amateur wrestler, but was also a great wrestler and also has connections with uh, the Poffos. Uh, yeah, so he, yeah, he was awesome, man. He was awesome, and he taught me a lot. 
uh, during those early years, man. And uh, so anyway, uh, well, hold on, hold on. When did, when did you get, I'm assuming the first TV you did was Memphis, right? The first break I got was Memphis. And we went over this uh, in one of the last episodes, but I, I think me and you probably have talked about this, but, you know, I used to pick you up at the airport for TNA every week, and then we'd go play yep. game. Uh, <laughs> That's so, awesome. But uh, Jeff actually, uh, in 1992 or three, I was on a show. Me and Jamie had started doing the PG-13 thing. I was doing it by myself at first, and then I met Jamie, and then Chris Champion suggested that we do it as a tag team. And I came up with the name, and I came up with all that shit. And uh, Jeff was on the show, uh, independent show. And back then, we called it Outlaw Show. We were on Outlaw yeah. Show. <laughs> and Jeff held the VCR camera with the big VCR tape in it, and video... <laughs> Me and Jamie wrestling Brickhouse, and I think it was Pez Watley. It might have been someone else that night, but I know I wrestled him too there. But anyway, uh, <laughs> Jeff took the, the 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 VHS tape to his dad and said, "Take a look at this." And that's when we went to Jerry Jarrett's house. And uh, there's a whole another story on how we got the job. We showed up at Jerry's house and put our gimmick on and. He laughed, and Jamie told me before we walked in, <laughs> if we could make Jerry laugh, we got a job. Right. So we, <laughs> right. And uh, he said, let me hear about, let me see this gimmick I've been hearing about. And so we went into his other room. We changed clothes and put the gimmick on, put the hubcap around our neck. He started laughing. <laughs> and you, was that the big house across the street or across the pond from Johnny Cash? Absolutely. That was the big Wow. House. Wow, that's cool. I think it was that's cool George history Jones' there. house at one time, I think, if I'm not mistaken. I think Jerry got it really? George Jones wow. down the line. Yeah. Totally wow. Must have been. One question I want to ask you, because, you know, you first are coming into TNA, and, and having been in WCW, and unfortunately, James Vandenberg, you know, not unfortunately that you were James yeah. Vandenberg. Well, no, it was unfortunately, but go on. <laughs> Unfortunately, you saw that company go down in flames. With that being said, you had known Wolfie from seeing him as this kind of punk hip hop kid. Now you're seeing him as Slash, and he's got this totally different look. What was your first reaction to that? I mean, how did you? Um, I, I thought he looked cool as shit, and he, he had that uh, hus Siberian husky eye, uh, contact lens in and shit. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, nah, he, he was he was he was really cool looking, and um, I mean I didn't know it was Wolfie D at the time. I saw Wolfie D was probably right before they got fired from WWE for whatever Jamie Dundee did. <laughs> but I remember they would. <laughs> I remember seeing them in the Nation of Domination back when I was at WCW. You know, and they were, I, 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 I don't know how much you guys wrestled. I don't know how much I saw, but I, I remember you guys would go out there with the nation and, you know, raise your fist in the air and all that. But um, no, I saw him and I thought, yeah, that, that this kind of fits, you know, and it, 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 it took a, I would say it took a couple of weeks, maybe a couple of months, to figure things out. Because I remember at first, Jerry Jarrett and Wolfie, you may remember this very early on, uh, Jerry wanted to do something about the blood of the all dad, if you remember that, where we had to paint blood on Sonny Siaki. And and it, it required like a lot of discussion, you know, and, and I had to do color commentary to kind of discuss what the blood of the all dad means and why you put it on their head. And I remember after that, I was like, you know, I don't want to do this is not wrestling um, in, in terms of having to discuss all that shit, you know, like doing backstory on things. And and that part of things, again, that was like phase one of the new church, as I recall. Um, but uh, when when Borash made that, that fucking uh, new package of us or whatever, when, when we when we uh, got that second push, uh, that that's when things started to really gel. And, it you know, it felt like a cohesive team. Um right. And, and and I remember, I mean, it, it's been, what, almost 20 fucking years. Um, but, um, yeah, I just, I just remember feeling like this is like the, the this this feels like I'm at home. I know these guys and we're a team, you know what I mean? It was, yep. um, it, and it felt very organic and real. 
as opposed to, you know, the, the first, and, and no disrespect to Malice, Jerry Toot, but he didn't, it was kind of like, like when they just throw a tag team together, you know, right. he really, he wasn't part of the thing, you know, good guy, but I'm just saying it just, it was like, you know, just throwing any two random guys together and calling them the new church. But right. uh, when they, when they put you and Brian together and, and, you know, you had the kind of evil, crazy looking fucking thing going on. And Brian, I remember, um, I remember I changed his name to Killdozer, and there, there's a quick story on that. Because they were calling him Bulldozer Brian Lee in ECW, as I recall. And there was a TV show when I was a little kid starring James Brolin called Killdozer, and it was a stupid science fiction movie about a bulldozer that was demonically possessed. <laughs> just fucked nice. shit up. Uh, so, uh, so I figured I figured I would just, you know... That not to uh, step on uh, ECW's trademark toes, we'll just call him Killdozer, and that kind of worked, you know. But uh, it was we, we made some fucking magic in 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 the asylum there, Wolfie. I mean, it was those are yeah. really yeah. special, uh, important times. Yes, and and I, I want to step in real quick and just say, man, you know, Jamie and I were. Man, I could look at Jamie, he could look at me, and he knew exactly what I wanted him to do. Next, a very close next, was Brian. Mm -hmm. I've had a lot of tag team partners. I've always been a tag team guy. But the very closest thing to Jamie was Brian. And I don't, it just clicked, man. Like you said, it just fucking clicked. And the thing that, that amazed me the most, is it took a second in my mind, this is the, you know, we can tell stories from every angle, you know, your story, right. my, Brian's story. But from my story, what I saw was at first, Brian didn't trust me because he right. had been, like I said, I was a kid coming to the fairgrounds watching Brian and right. he had been in the business so much longer, but then he realized I had a good mind for this shit and he started listening to me. And when we were working with James Storm and uh, Chris Harris, and, and you know, I, I trained James. And so it's like I was I was the general for everybody. And I, I really yeah. took, I really took part of that. And and one thing I'll never forget, and I thank you for so much, Jim. One time you told me, you said, Wolfie, you're my fucking meal ticket. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that you were amazing. Part, you know what I, mean? I told you earlier tonight um, when we were texting before when we couldn't get the fucking phone hooked up earlier or whatever. I said <laughs> you were the new church. You were the fucking bedrock. You know what I mean? You you were what Bobby Eaton was. You, you were what Bobby Eaton was to Jim Cornette to me. You know what I mean? Yeah. Whatever, whoever else came or went, I knew that I could count on you to do your shit. And then here's the other thing as, as like a fucking, uh, manager, um, you know, like, especially like when you're doing outlaw shows and shit, a lot of times people are like, eh, fuck you. I don't need anybody to talk to me, talk for me, you know, that kind of thing. Right. And, and they just have fucking attitudes and whatnot. And, and you didn't do that. And, and neither did Brian, you know what I mean? But that way it just, it felt it, it just it was like, hey, we're all together in this, and uh, it, it it was just really organic. You know, it, it took a couple weeks to to click, but when it did, that's when we started getting that pop, like we were baby faces. You know, no matter what kind of heinous shit we did, yeah. you know, they were still cheering us because what you guys were doing was so cool. You know, and and you were doing things, and and I also give credit to America's Most Wanted. You guys were doing things that were so kind of innovative and different from the rest of the uh, the rest of the show that both teams really stood out. I mean, it was it was great, great, great. Times. And 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 God rest her soul, man, Belladonna. I thought that that was just a really plus for us, and I really hated it that they got rid of her because I really thought that she 
absolutely added something to our thing. I don't know if you remember this. Uh, I think the first time we won the titles back or whatever, do you remember when I was bleeding profusely and she grabbed my blood and was rubbing it all over her, like all over her boobs and everything like that? Yeah. To yeah, me, that was a classic moment, man. She that was, was gangster. <laughs> yeah. And by the way, why did they get rid of her? Was this just one of those things where they started losing money and they were cutting everything back? Um, that that could have been the same time. At one point, they got rid of me for a little bit and tried to do the new church without me. I think. I, but, I don't know. I don't know, Jim. I don't remember. Um, it could have had something to do with, uh, for some reason, I feel like it was her boyfriend uh, who I also trained. I, I think it could have had something to do with that. I don't remember 100%. My memory's not uh, the best, but I think it could have had something to do with that. But I. But no, she, dude, she was she was cool. On, and the other thing that was great was because, you know, I was like, man, I don't want to be taking a bunch of fucking bumps. You know what I mean? <laughs> so he was, <laughs> instead of me having to take the bumps, I, and I could have oh, done the shit she did. She'd go in there and take crazy, crazy bumps, man. And, uh, yeah, she she was a, a definite asset. I mean, like, at first, I remember when Jerry Jarrett said, we want to put you with this girl. And I kind of looked at him like, who the fuck is this? And he's like, come up with a name. And yeah. I, I, I came up with Belladonna. I was trying to think of something witchy, you know, and and I, I stole that from the Stevie Nicks album, but, you know, yeah. it's a poison. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But, uh, yeah. but, yeah, she was an immediate asset, and she was over, yeah. you know. I mean, she should have, she would have stayed with us, um, you know, I mean, it, it would have been great. She was, she was a real talent for those. And, and honestly, I think there's a bunch of incidents with us where they drop the ball. They totally drop the ball, especially when, uh, we started getting to that point where it was just like, every time we'd walk out, it was evil, 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 evil for right. the people. And, the, and, the, and that's when Russo came in and he didn't know what to do with us. And, and, and that also kind of baffled me because when I was with uh, WWF at the time doing the nation thing, Vince Russo loved me and Jamie. He put right. me on the cover of the fucking WWF magazine. I mean, when he was in that role where he was right. trying to that. So he liked us, but then when it came to TNA, I'm not really sure what happened there, why he lost, you know, like faith in me or faith in us. I don't know. It, it was just a weird situation, man. It really was uh, because I feel like, like I said, we got over. The people were doing the evil thing, and then they gave us the whole – because if you remember – uh, they kind of let us go a couple of times. It's like me and Brian, yeah. and we had that good run, but then also at the same time, they're like, okay, we don't know what to do with you. That whole, we don't know what to do with you thing. Well, that's your fucking job is to know what to do exactly. with you. Exactly. And here's the thing. That, this is almost like the story of my entire career up to the <laughs> day is every time, every fucking time I start getting over, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm like, Oh, I'm going to the next level. Nope, you're off TV for six months or something. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And and they did that with our fucking team. They would they would we we'd be over as hell. And then I mean I know we sound like old farts going yeah we were over and we sold out everything. That's not what I'm saying. But I mean, um, <laughs> we we would we would clearly I mean if you just sat behind the curtain and listened to the reactions of you know who who was getting over, um, we we were up there. You know, right in that top tier, and it would. And I, I, the only thing I can imagine is budgetary things. You know, and then, you know, I have no, I have no idea what the checkbook was like before Dixie came in, and and actually, Dixie was in. Uh, Dixie was Dixie in when we did the Raven thing. Yeah. Okay, I, that might have been early in that, but um. There's two things I want to hit on there. Yeah. Uh, Dixie, I know for a fact, because I was told it, Dixie was, like, legitimately scared of me. Like, yeah. <laughs> fucking, like, ridiculous. Like, she believed the character. So that, for me, 
in a way that's like I did my job. <laughs> in other words, yeah, well, you know that's that's why she fired me. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> but also it's well, the best. And I, I just think I, I thought I was I thought I was going to sabotage Vince Russo when he was interviewing me one time, and I went, "So why did I, why exactly why did I get fired after all that?" And he goes. Well, it was Dixie because people were booing you and hissing you. And that she thought if people were booing you and she was scared of you, you must not, you know, be a, a whatever, a good person or whatever. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but, but yeah, so, I mean, it, it's entirely, <laughs> I, I wouldn't have any problem believing at all that you scared her. You know? I mean, and, and I've, I've been told that by more than one person. And so I think that was kind of a thing. It, it also a thing was, I just think we were too, when, when Russo came in, his objective was to get, they started doing what the, the sex thing and then what they called it with the, the Harris brothers and it's entertainment right. extreme. Yeah. Yeah. And then they started using us, and and I can't remember, Jim, help me here. Uh, I feel like you weren't with right. me no more. Um, I was in all the matches with the the ECW guys. It was it was me and Brian and um, fuck, I can't remember Shane Douglas. I think was yeah, on our, against CM Punk, against Sandman, against New Jack, against all the fucking ECW guys. I can't remember if you if you were still there or not, but then they put us into that. So it was like I was bleeding every fucking night. I was fucking doing hardcore matches. And it was like it just they got off the rails with what we were doing and what we were. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. that that yeah, I was I was there for that. That was when Douglas was there, that was when we went into the where um and, and what pissed me off was where they started kind of detuning the new church yeah. as the feature. And it was more like, okay, it's a feud between me and Raven, if that makes sense. Yeah. But right. you know, what the fuck I am mean, I going to do with Raven? I mean, you got one match out of me eventually down the road, but I'm not a fucking wrestler. Let's take a quick time out and get a word from one of my dope-ass sponsors, and we'll be right back with more Live and in Color with Wolfie D. Hey, it's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo concert in Kansas City, go Kevin! Or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda, you never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price, Priceline. Hey, folks, to get your official Live It In Color with Wolfie D merchandise, go to ProWrestlingTees.com forward slash Live Wolfie D. Check it out. If you're listening to Live and in Color with Wolfie D on Apple Podcast and like what you're hearing, go ahead and leave a five-star rating. And while you're at it, write a review. Tell us what you liked. Tell us what you'd like to hear in the future. It's very important to us and always appreciated. Thanks again. Let's talk about this real quick. And, and I know me and you have talked about it. Um <laughs> And and I just talked to uh, Scotty the other day about coming on this podcast. So you know, in in talking about this, I want to say that me and me and Scotty are cool. But that night, I really wanted to punch him in the face. Uh, <laughs> he just had. You remember you had uh, some very dull clippers, and you were shaving his head. And then when we came back to the back, he was trying to punk you out in front of everybody. And I was standing there, and going through my head was, I'm fixing to punch Raven right in his fucking mouth because what a fucking big man to sit here. Because he was, he was fucking browbeating you, man, in front of everybody. I don't know if yeah. you remember. Yeah. He was, oh, I remember it clear as day. Because <laughs> the Clippers were dull, and you did. You did. Cut well, well, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say the Clippers are dull. Here's my spin on that, okay? Um, so 
before, you know, I've never shaved anybody's fucking head. I hadn't shaved my own head, right? And I went to Jeff Jarrett, and, okay, we, I remember, and, if, and here's the thing. If you look at the pay-per-view in the pre, the package they put together, there's like four or five, four, or several clippers, maybe three kinds of clippers and a bunch of scissors, right? But at the time we got to the ring, there was one set of clippers and maybe a pair of scissors, right? And the thing was, they sounds told me like a murderer. Say what? This sounds like making a murderer. Like yeah. <laughs> so so I I had looked. I mean I like when I was being lazy. Like I had a, a beard clipper, but I never used it. I would just use it to be lazy and shave my the unbearded part of my face real quick, right? So I looked at Jeff. I said, Jeff, I've never done this shit before. I go, what do I do? And I just ran it across my arm in the same way I ran it across Raven's head. Okay, but in the same way. So turned upside down. <laughs> and I go, and I ran the hair off my arm, and I said, so do it like this? He goes, yeah, just like that. So we get out there, and, and the thing I'd been told, uh, Ron or Don, it was Don Harris, said, if all else goes wrong, these are sheep shears, right? The <laughs> sheep shears look like a jack-o'-lantern's mouth, okay? They didn't look like regular fucking... Uh, shears that you use on your hair, right? They were used for shearing fucking sheep. So they're, they were fucking pretty vicious and they were, they were a shoot, you know? So yeah. we get out there and that's the only thing we have. So with that information, um, I just took it and turned it the same way upside fucking down. <laughs> you know, I didn't know any better. Um, and, and, and his hair, his scalp starts peeling off and his hair still doesn't grow in those places where that happened. But, um, that really I, I, my guess hair. is, he, oh yeah, look at the front of his hair. He's even said, I can see but that. <laughs> here, here's the thing. My guess. And then you remember Raven had a lot. I love Raven, but he had a lot of fucking heat at the time with the office. Right. And I know the Harris's fucking hated his guts. You know, and um, my guess is that Ron or Don, whoever was, I don't remember, both of them were there. One of them probably said, okay, this is going to be a rib. Let's just leave the shoot shears there, right? Which would have hurt if I used them the right way. But when I turned them upside down, it just like, it was like putting a potato peeler on his fucking head, you know? Yeah. Oh, my um, God. So, um, but, but yeah, so then, yeah, he, we came, I came to the back after, and he took it like a man. And I remember we were going off the air, and I remember the referee giving us the Iggy, like, oh, man, we got to do this now. So I had like 30 seconds, and I'm nervous, and I got shit upside down. And I'm watching Wedding. I'm watching his scalp, just like you're mowing a lawn, except the lawn is coming up. And he took it like a man. But when we went back there, I remember at first I walked through there, and Jerry Jarrett, and I believe it's the only time Jerry Jarrett, the man of the cloth, I'm pretty sure he looked at me and said, you almost cut his goddamn head off or words to that of something about goddamn, which and I was like, whoa, that came out of Jerry yeah. Jarrett's mouth. <laughs> and not long after that, fucking Raven came through that curtain and started cutting promos. You remember that? Fuck you. I don't ever want to work with you. You're a fucking Mark. Fuck you, you piece of shit. Blah, blah, blah. And he's going on and on. And I'm going, Raven, what the, you know, I didn't mean to do it. What? The, yeah, I'm so sorry. And he reared back and he threw a punch at me. And I'll give him this. He did pull the punch at the last second. I mean, you could almost see it in his eyes like, uh, oops. But he pulled it at the last second. But right after he did that, dude, you jumped in there and jumped on his ass, you know? And, yeah. And, and then they had to do a pull apart with you and Raven, you know, yeah. and, uh, you know, and of course we had all that shit worked out like probably about the next day or two days later. Yeah. But, uh, but I, I always, I, I mean, to this day, I always tell people, man, Wolfie's my dog because, you know, I, I, you know, I'd fucked up, you know, and then I was, pro I was probably a patsy like Lee Harvey Oswald, <laughs> you know, I was a patsy and part yeah. of a fuck Raven up scheme. But, um, but yeah, you, you came in and you, you, you were ready to go down with the fucking ship, you know, and, and I appreciated that. Obviously, huge history with him. I was with him uh, when he was Scotty Flamingo in USWA, uh, Johnny Polo, all that, uh, in ECW when we worked there before TNA. Uh, uh -huh. 
and me and him were were cool. I could I could tell you a story about me <laughs> him and Jamie uh, in probably like ninety three, ninety four, something like that. We were headed to a town, and me and Jamie used to drive this uh, like seventy four Thunderbird. <laughs> <laughs> and it, 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 you, we, we used to get the the recap tires. We have blowouts all the time. Get, <laughs> it, it had, uh, you know, where the like the vinyl roof on top. It was like rusted out. So when it would rain, it had the bucket seats in the front. And so when it would rain, I'd have to scoot over in the middle, and we'd have to sit next <laughs> to each other like a couple. <laughs> <laughs> and so this Scotty was with us one time and uh the car broke down at the the one twenty six. I'll never forget the one twenty six exit there was a there was a truck stop there and we ended up having to push the car over the fucking <laughs> interstate over to the truck stop to get it fixed and everything. Uh so I've got I, I had a history with him at that point. And Did you make the town on time? I don't remember. <laughs> I don't remember if you made that one or not. But sometimes, uh, sometimes I'm not, right? With him and then did such, you know, we did good shit with him uh, in TNA. But that night, I just remember, man, you know, you were my guy and I was your guy. And for yeah, him, and you know, here, here's the thing with Johnny, like, I mean, years later, he'd probably say something different. But it wasn't long after that. I told him, and you may or may not remember this, um, the word being circulated around was that Raven had told them uh, to get rid of you guys and put me with somebody else. I don't know who that somebody else was supposed to be, yeah. but, but prior to the head shaving, I were you and Brian <laughs> being pissed off and like, I'm going to beat this motherfucker's ass. He's yeah. going to, he's trying to fucking uh, take my job. away. And in fact, actually before the head shaving, it was the night, I don't know if the thing was in the sheets or something, but you guys heard that. And I remember going to you and you were like, I'm going to fuck Raven up. I'm going to take his kneecap out or word, something like that. Whatever, whatever Wolfie D would have done to somebody you wanted to fuck up. And I remember going, Wolfie, you can't do that. Dude, dude, we're in a spot with Raven. If you, if you do that, we're all out of a fucking job. But you and Brian were real, he, real fucking hot. I remember telling Raven not long after that, maybe a year after or whatever, I was like, dude, they wanted to kill you. And he's like, no, no, they love me. And I was like, no, Raven, you have no fucking idea how much heat you had. I was like, yeah. you got a couple of fucking redneck boys from Tennessee that were ready to break your fucking legs and yeah. give zero fucks about it. And you're sitting here going, no, everybody loves me. I'm like, no, they didn't love you. You know, yeah. they were they're ready to fucking kill you. And I, I kept them from fucking killing your ass. Yeah, you know, right, man. I'm telling you, that night, man, when he came back and he was browbeating you in front of everybody. And I thought, like, my thoughts on it were. What a what a bully, man! Why are you gonna Why are you gonna fucking do this to Jim? You know what I mean? You know, no. If you're ready to fight, I'm fixing to jump in. You are gonna fight me first? Well, man. you jumped. You you definitely jumped. <laughs> but it was, uh, but and, you know, and, and just so everybody knows, me and Raven were cool like two nights after that. We've been cool yeah. ever afterwards. But yeah. you know, I mean, look, I understand. <laughs> if I had to sit there for ninety seconds and have some asshole you know, potato peel my head, I'd probably be pretty hot myself. Yeah. But, um, but, but yeah, here's the thing. As, as fucked up as that was, talk about a classic fucking moment in TNA when that happened, you know? Yeah. That was, that was, that was, uh, that was some intense real shit. Yeah. And, uh, and the thing that I didn't like was after that, I remember, I get, well, I didn't know it at the time. They were, and I don't know who made this call. Well, I don't know if it was Dixie or, uh, or Russo, somebody, somebody wanted my ass out of there, right? So um, I remember Dutch calling me and going, so what are we going to do after you do this? What would you be doing? And I said, well, you know, if I'm a super villain, which is how I've always kind of seen myself more than a wrestling manager, I'm like, I would just go hide like Osama bin Laden in a cave and send in tapes, you know, so he couldn't touch me, you know, like a, like a complete fucking coward talking shit from a distance. And none of that shit worked. And then, like, uh, I think, like, after we did the blow-off, and the, the other thing was, uh, like, one week after another, they started killing you guys off yeah. until he got to me. And then I don't, I don't think you guys came back for a while. And I yeah. started to see the writing on the wall. 
But I, I still thought they were going to bring me back. Anyhow, I did the fucking blow off match with Raven and I bled like a fucking, you know, whatever. And, and, he, and he got some receipts in on me for his hair. Um, I actually came out of that, Wolfie. Um, my, I, I broke my thumb and, and had a cracked orbital bone and shit. And, uh, I, I mean, I, I was pretty beat up because, you know, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing, you know, yeah. <laughs> but, um, and, and bled like a, just bled like a stuff I bled like you, you know? <laughs> so, uh, like I had the whole, like rose colored glasses saying, I'm assuming you've been endured that with as much as you've bled. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Everything's like, Oh shit. Everything's red. <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, they, they, uh, shit canned us all immediately after that for a little while. And, uh, yeah. in fact, did they, did they ever bring us back after that? together as a team. I don't think they Man, did. did they? I, remember the, I think they put me with CM Punk and Julio after that, didn't they? What I was going to ask you next, you know, when we came back for that uh, that reunion fucking pay-per-view where they had me and Sin come in. Uh, right. I hated that. I absolutely hated that uh, for a, a number of reasons. Uh, what I want to ask you is why do you think they did not have you go to the ring with us? I have no idea. That that was the show where Sin got all the heat <laughs> of setting off the firecrackers or whatever, yeah. right? <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, no, I don't know because I thought I thought that was going to be the, like the, I thought I was going to be working with both you and uh, uh, Judas Macias. Yes. No, and I and uh, I, I have no idea. But that, dude, that was such an ill-conceived pay-per-view, I'm and I remember sure. it was, wasn't it every match was like a stupid gimmick. I have never been on a fucking pay-per-view where, I swear to God, we worked, uh, what was it, LAX, and I swear to God, we did not talk to those guys until about fucking 15 minutes before we went to the ring. And this is a pay-per-view. So I can tell the, you know, I know TNA was at a bad point right there, whatever, but... It's like everybody's attitude sucked, and you know, I it, for me, uh, it was okay. This could be a chance for me to get a job back because Al right. had me on that uh, and asked me to come do it. And when he first called me, I swear to God, I was laying in the bed, I was hurt. I don't remember what was wrong with me, uh, just just being my age or whatever, and fucking hurting. And I told him no. I said, no, man. I said, dude, I'm in the bed right now. My fucking back's fucked up, blah, 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 blah. No, I don't want to do it. I hung up the phone, and I sat there, and I thought for about 10 minutes. And I called him right back, and I said, Al, I'll be there. He said, are you sure? And I said, yeah, I'll be there. And I fucking worked out twice a day to try to just rehab myself and whatnot and get back because I thought, you know what, this is probably going to be my last chance at any kind of run. And right. so then I show up, I see you, fucking happy to see you. Uh, you didn't go to the ring with us, which kind of weirded me out. Um, and I just felt very unwelcomed and, like I said, did not talk to the guys that I was wrestling on a pay-per-view until 15 minutes before we went to the ring. And I was like, what the fuck? You know? Dude, I remember the agents were backstage. I won't use their names, but the yeah. agents, um, one whose name you may have used, were, were walking up backstage going, well, we've just killed the town. And, and this was just throughout the course of the show. And yeah. I had gotten called. I mean, look, I'd been off TV at that point. That was, what, 2013? Yeah. I'd been off TV since 2008. I had gotten, um, you know, pissed off, angry, depressed, and fat. Right, because yeah. I was like, I, I couldn't understand why you just took me off when I was at the top of my fucking shit, and you know what I mean. So I just yeah. sat around and got fat and got fucked up, and you know, ate all day. So I'm like sixty pounds overweight. And right. Pat Kenny called me and he goes, "Oh, Vandy, we need you. Can you be there tomorrow?" I'm like, "Dude, I can't even fit into my clothes." I, yeah. I remember I had I had to get one of those gimmicks that where you can stretch the button on your pants or whatever just to wear my my suit. And, yeah. you know, I mean, I, I mean, I was fat. I looked like shit. I didn't want to be there, but the fact was I needed the money. I, at that point, I did. And so I took the gig, but he said, oh, nobody will ever see it. It's for overseas. And that was true for a while. And then, I don't know, like a year or two later, they, they aired it. And then those fucking pictures of me all fat and shit came out. So I wasn't happy about that. 
but but yeah, that that was a an ill conceived pay per view and and a waste of talent in a lot of ways. And and I still, I mean, I, I'm pretty sure every once in a while uh, we've been on the phone over the last ten years or so and talk about getting the band back together, you know, and yeah. and I, you know I. I I mean, I don't know what kind of shape you're in these days. Um, at least recently, I've seen that you were doing the Cerebus gimmick, which uh, looked to be pretty fucking cool. Uh, wherever you were working, what was the name of that promotion you were doing uh, that in? Traditional Championship Wrestling. Um, that, that guy had a good thing going. I think they just ran out of money, and they had a lot well, of it. It was one of those deals where we've seen it a thousand times where... Uh, you know, you get it going, you got the right people in the right positions, but then all of a sudden you think your friends can book it and you can book it better uh, when you've never been to the Super Bowl. That's what I always say, but sure. Yeah. But uh, at, at any rate, man, I, I want to double triple thank you uh, for coming on here and talking with me, man. Um, I, I see you with your kid and that's something I did I swear to God, <laughs> a day in my life. Is Father James Mitchell with the little kids <laughs> being the best father ever, man? You did the father. yeah, that that that, that was that was a uh, life changing experience at fifty two oh, at the time. Man. Like, oh shit, how did I do that? <laughs> oh, now, I, um, uh, I'm really happy for you. And, and well, and, thank you, I appreciate that. But uh, on that also, everything I, 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 awesome. It, Here's what I say about like uh, one thing I learned from fatherhood is as much as well you got it you got kids too but as yeah. as much as like you know like I had no kids for 52 fucking years I mean I had stepkids and shit but, you know you never have your own kid I never had my own kid and it was like eh, you know I, I don't have time for this emotional drama and suddenly you realize you're responsible for, yeah. for this 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 little creature. It yeah. doesn't give a fuck or no, or, or is not responsible for what you've done before you created him. And you know what I mean? And, and it just puts things in a different perspective. And, and it put my whole uh, wrestling thing in a different perspective because now, um, and I look, if somebody pays me to go do a wrestling show or do an appearance, I'll, I'll give them a hundred percent, but yeah. I don't think about the shit when I'm not doing it, which is the difference because I have more important shit that I have to worry about. You know what I mean? I don't have time to worry about who said what, who did this, what's the angle. Hey, let's get on the phone and talk about what we're going to do next time. That, I, no, I've got a fucking two-year-old kid now. You know what I mean? And and it, it just changes things. And um, I, I remember you posted something when I started putting pictures online of him. And you're like, holy shit, who, it's weird as shit to see you with a little kid, but who would have thought you would have been <laughs> super dad? And, and that was really cool. That's awesome, man. One of the coolest things to me about you is you're similar to Wolfie in the fact that you've been everywhere, in my opinion, everywhere, because Smoky Mountain, I'm a kid from Southwest Virginia, East Tennessee area, so I have that Appalachian draw with the Mid-Atlantic, and, and seeing you at Smoky Mountain, <laughs> seeing you in WCW, seeing you in Impact, and I, I watch TNA. One of the things that I was curious about, especially during your run there, is do you feel like you guys they were trying to run like the naturals and America's most wanted. And it was almost like, I don't want to say this the wrong way, but they were kind of like normal tag teams. And then you guys were almost like this really heavy handed tag team, meaning you also had this massive story, almost, you know, like a comic book with you. Do you think that that hindered you maybe because they had these like, well, we're going to push these straight up tag teams, but the disciples of the new church, they have all this story with them and everything. Do you think that that could have hurt you there possibly like it was almost too much? Uh, yeah. And, and I'll, I'll say this and I say this with all due respect. Um, I remember when uh, Jerry Jarrett wrote his book several years ago about uh -huh. the creation of TNA. He had a line in there where he said, I've always tried to instill in my son's head, no matter what's going on, once you have your lead guy, you never let anybody upstage your featured talent. You follow me? Gotcha. Yes. And, and I, when I read that, it was like a light bulb went off in my head because I was thinking, holy shit, we, you mean me and Wolfie and Brian were getting better reactions than people who are being booked above us 
You know what I mean? Boom. Right. And and yeah. I was like, okay, the, you know, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. And so maybe it was like, but and that, that's the thing I was saying. It was like earlier where why why do we get pulled off TV when we're hot? And it's almost like these guys are getting, and I don't want to sound like, you know, the old fart who says they sold out every building. But every time we were pulled off TV, Wolfie, we were hot. Yeah. It, wasn't, yeah. it wasn't that we weren't getting over. It was like, we're getting really over. And it's like, wait, why are we not there? Yeah. Oh, you're out of yeah. money. How about not use a couple of these fucking vanilla guys that are just filler, you know? And, and, and maybe make us do a three times longer match, you know? So, um, yeah, I, I think, um, I think we were a little, a little too, uh, strong, um, visually, you know what I mean? So, so yeah, I mean, like they, they, they may have had, uh, had whomever, I don't remember who they were pushing at the time, but, um, they had, designs on somebody else and that's who they were going with and you know if, if you got these three crazy looking fucks that are supposed to be heels they're getting baby face reactions bigger than the baby faces that they're pushing right. yeah you better better put them on the back burner or take them off the stove completely you know yeah 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 and and you know that makes total sense i know this is a long comparison especially with brian in the mix there you guys were kind of the tag team undertaker in a sense you know how he works within the fold his time but they also had to have these kind of giants or monsters work with him whereas if you put him with a stone cold it didn't work as much and i think they even admitted that right but long story short you guys had this like comic book mythical amazing like dark story that you could have i mean man that could have been the spotlight for its own show in my opinion and unfortunately you know they were pushing guys in trunks and again nothing wrong with trunks i support that entirely but my point being is i kind of felt like they almost undersold you now that you've said that it makes total sense my question i won't bug you along here about this but in my personal opinion you know this isn't hyperbole i promise not while i got you on the phone here but you are with bobby heenan jim Cornette, as far as the tops in my personal opinion who did you like as a manager who was your um, kind of opinion of that okay when okay when i first started watching wrestling uh, you know, you know, when you watch wrestling as, and it's, you know, and I wish, I wish I never knew about the inside of wrestling because it was more fun when I was a mark, if that right. makes sense. Right. You know, when you, when you don't know how the sausage is made. So when I was a kid, um, I, I got mid Atlantic wrestling, Georgia wrestling, Florida wrestling, and IWA wrestling all on our cable system in like 1975, 76, 77. And uh, the managers at the time, Boris Malenko was manager of the Mass Superstar. Gary Hart had his army in uh, yeah. Georgia. Um, so Gary Hart was a big deal. Uh, Rock Hunter uh, took his place, and then J.J. Dillon came in. And then I didn't watch wrestling for a while. Um, I remember the first wrestling manager I ever saw, which was before I was really watching wrestling, when my dad was watching it when I was a little kid in New Jersey, the Grand Wizard showed up yeah. on TV and I, 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 I can't, I think he was with Stan Stasiak. I could be wrong. This was like 1973 or something. I was maybe six years old, but, um, I remember the grand wizard showed up and he had those cool glasses on. And, uh, if you know, the comic book character, the flash, right. Oh yeah. They had a, his, his main villain was a guy named captain cold who had like a parka, but he wore those same sunglasses. Right. So I right. thought I was kind of looking at Captain Cold. So the, the Grand oh, Wizard wow. was the first manager I ever saw. And then, you know, whatever. I had forgotten about that until years later. But anyway, um, when I started uh, trying to get into wrestling or started, you know, redoing it or fell back in love with it um, in my adolescence, J.J. Um, Dillon, who was with the Horsemen, I loved him, right? I, I did. Yeah, I wasn't too crazy about him when he was in Georgia when I was a kid, um, and I, I don't mean, you know, what I mean, he just he wasn't as exciting as Gary Hart or whatever at the time. But when he was with the Horsemen, I, I whatever, I kind of tried to pattern myself after that, and uh, Bobby Heenan. So when I when I the, the thing was before I got to TV, my first time. If you would look at any old uh, outlaw tapes of me, assuming any still exist, um, 
I was just like trying to walk around and do JJ Dillon or Bobby Heenan shit as far as like the way they, they walked and moved and stuff like that. And, mm-hmm. uh, it was when I went to WCW, it was like Dallas Page. I'd, I'd been to Smoky Mountain, and uh, Dallas Page looked at my tape because they needed a manager for Mortis and then and, and Rath. And he said, uh, "Nah, that that's not going to get over with Eric. You've got to be a character." And he came up with this whole creepy slow thing. And he like he meticulously produced this promo tape that he took the Bischoff to hire, get me hired. Bischoff personally hired me in Dallas Page's man game, although years later he now says I'm a piece of shit and I had no talent and whatnot, but he's the guy who fucking hired me. But, right. um, but yeah, but after, I mean, so that, that, <clears throat> you know, that was me not being me. That was me kind of following a template, I guess, like when you go to WWE and they make you the garbage man or the red rooster sure. and you, right. <laughs> you know, but, I, you know, it was after that, you know, and I kept a little bit of that with me. You know, I kept what worked. I got rid of what didn't. Sure. But, uh, yeah, the, so the, uh, and, and then years later, to bring it back to what you originally asked me, um, when I started being able to get old tapes of things, I would say, and as weird as it is, because I never really got, I, I got to see the Grand Wizard when I was, you know, like Madison Square Garden would come on once a month on HBO or something. And you mm-hmm. get the garden matches, um, and the Wizard was there. But I, I think so. I, I look at these old tapes now. I think, as far as a spiritual forebearer, for some reason, I, I think the Grand Wizard probably was my guy, ultimately, because of the three wise men of the East, Blassie and Albano, and the Wizard. Uh, I thought the Wizard was a better wordsmith. You know, and he had a certain delivery and he wasn't a guy. He didn't take bumps. He didn't try to interfere a whole lot. He just sat there and laid down the law. And I think, I, I don't know if that rubbed off on me subconsciously over the years, but um, I, I, I would think if you had to compare me to somebody um, that as an influence, well, probably the Grand Wizard. There's a long way around that. What your next question, Jimmy? I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that was awesome. And Mr. Ernie Roth, I mean, the Grand Wizard, what a great manager. I, I'm i not as familiar with him. Like I said earlier, I'm a Gary Hart mark. I tried to emulate him being a six foot two guy trying to manage guys not always six foot, you know. So at right. the same time, uh, you know, right now, I, you know, I just want to say thank you so much for coming on the show. It really means a lot, especially to Wolfie and I. You know, we love to have you back anytime time. One thing that does lead into this, though, is we do have a new segment that we've been using for the last couple of episodes. And Wolfie, you know, asked if it would be okay if we involved you in this. And I think it's a good idea, especially being that you have your finger on the pulse of things. And I like to bring these to Wolfie because they surprise him as well. So it's a segment on the show we have called Current Affairs. And let me step in, uh, (laughs) Mitchell. (laughs) and tell you that he does this to me because he knows that I don't watch wrestling anymore. The only thing that I see is shit on Facebook. So he throws these current events at me just to get these weird reactions. So well, if you're going to throw current event wrestling shit, I'm not going to know any more than Wolfie, but go on. Good. <laughs> yeah. And I was kind of hoping for that. So we're going to head into current affairs. DJ hit the music. It's a current affair. All right, we're back to Current Affairs with other James Mitchell. Thank you so much for coming on with us for Current Affairs. You know, really want to thank you again for coming on the episode with us. And to start off with Current Affairs, our first question, it's been all over as probably the most puzzling situation of the current time in wrestling is the release of Bray Wyatt. I don't say that I love everything about wrestling right now, but Bray Wyatt was one of those wrestlers that seemed to have it figured out, in my opinion. Now, being a purveyor of the dark arts as you are, I can imagine that you probably also enjoyed Bray Wyatt. But anyway, what, why do you think that happened? Do you have any thoughts on maybe why that um, happened? Why it happened? Um, 
Okay. Uh, well, first of all, I, I concur with you, uh, Bray Wyatt, uh, when he came out, I, I thought, yeah, this guy's really got something going on. And, and furthermore, uh, given his pedigree that his grandfather was fucking Black Jack Mulligan, who was the, the orig- my original favorite wrestler back in like 1975, 76, when he was the U.S. champion in Mid-Atlantic, um, he, he immediately would be a sentimental favorite of mine. But uh, yeah, Bray, if I had to guess, and this is me not as somebody who pays attention, I don't pay attention to any wrestling I'm not involved in. So everything I get is right. off the internet or if something comes through on a quick video clip on Twitter or something. Um, my guess would be that somebody in WWE thought that uh, he didn't have the right build, you know, the same way they shit on Samoa Joe or, or anybody, you know, who doesn't look like a cookie cutter um, uh, steroid right. guy, you know? Right. But I, I mean, I, I thought he got it. And then, and then as far as a guy who knew how to do his fucking character, and here's the thing, every time they gave him crazy shit to do, and that last thing with the fun house or whatever it was, Pee Wee's Playhouse yeah. kind of deal he did, what I loved about Bray Wyatt was he, he totally owned it. He jumped in, he shit his pants and dived in, as they said in Reservoir Dogs, you know what I mean? He just di- dived in and owned it. And no matter how crazy or over the top the shit was, he believed in what he was saying, which made it believable. So it it, it just baffles me that somebody is that good at what they do that that the powers that be would say we have to get rid of them. But you know what? It could be kind of like me and Wolfie were talking about earlier. It could be, oh, this guy's maybe a little too colorful. He might be a little more colorful than this other guy we're trying to push. We got to detune him, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, I was and, and, fan. Yeah, me too. And and I, I figured, I mean, it's it's kind of like saying, you know, do you like Black Sabbath? That's kind of an like a dumb question, you know. Right. Like, and so, right. with that being said, I assumed that you were a, a Bray Wyatt fan. I enjoyed his time from the very beginning when he was doing kind of the Max Cady, kind of reinventing yeah. the Dan Spivey gimmick, you know. Exactly, and and doing it right. Yeah, and it was beautiful. And you know, to me, I just feel like you know cutting him off like that. And it could have been that he signed a big contract. But anyway, one other thing I wanted to bug you about here. And and Wolfie, I want your input on this too, because, you know, the current wrestling, and again, I'm not a professional wrestler. I know you said that you left it to the experts as well, Father James. But what do you guys think about the current setup of telegraphed wrestling moves? And it bugs me to see this when a guy is going in for a clothesline and they have to really like reach their arm up way too high or because the guy that's running to it, you know, he ducks, but he doesn't duck enough. And, uh, or the suicide dive where everybody gathers together. <laughs> it's just so predictable. What, what do you guys, I mean, what, what's going on? How can we fix that? Uh, you want to go first? Okay. I, I don't know how to fix this, but I, I'm going to give you a little homework assignment, Jay. Okay. Because I, you know, as, because I never want to be the guy that just sits, I don't want to be the old fart who says back in my day, right? (laughs) Because everything changes and evolves. But here, here's a homework assignment for you. Go back on YouTube and find the earliest pro wrestling matches on film that you can find. Some of them like 1905, 1910, and then enter the words pro wrestling 1915, 1925, 1935, or whatever, right? The first time, at first, they it kind of looks like MMA, right? Right. Then you bump forward a few years, you see somebody give a beal. And that's like, that looks like some stupid shit, right? Then you go forward another five years, and now there's drop kicks. Well, whoa, that's a hell of a lot different than 1905. And then if you keep jumping like every five years and just look at any three, whatever the three most watched matches on YouTube are for those years, I mean, it changes. And, and the thing is, wrestling just becomes more bullshitty. It just does. For whatever <laughs> reason, I mean, it, it had to become that way because it was boring if it was a shoot. You know, you couldn't have a Ed Strangler-Lewis three-hour headlock match, and there were some of those back in the day. But so things keep changing and you know, I, I look at it, I, I, so when I look at stuff now and go, this just looks like choreographed bullshit, right? Right. It's, it's on the same trajectory. And I, I remember Ole Anderson talking about one time, um, you know, most people of our generation would think, oh, Ole Anderson's an old school guy. 
he referred to what he was doing as bullshit wrestling, right? That right. the kind of stuff like Vern Gagne might say, that's bullshit wrestling, right? But then, right. you know, when you, uh, and then around the time I started seeing Ole Anderson, you got the sunset flip. What the fuck is that? Who does that in real life, right? And then, right. you know what I mean? So it, it's evolved into whatever the fuck it is. And if I had a magic wand, um, I'm, I'm to the, I'm to the right of Jim Cornette on, on old school wrestling. You know, I wish right, everything right. was 1976 again, but, um, you, you know, I, I don't have that magic wand. Um, it's, it's not to my taste, which is why I don't watch it. But you know, when I'm, when I'm summoned to be part of it, I don't bitch about it. I try to do the best I can to be a part of it, which also means keep me physically the fuck out of it. Because I can't, I mean, look, the athletes these days are a hundred times better at just pure athleticism than they were even 10 years ago. You know, it's right, not necessarily right. storytelling. And, and that's the whole thing that's different. It looks like video games. So it's like there's a generation of people who played Mortal Kombat or whatever the fuck kids play. I don't know anything about video games. Or those ninja movie and ninja video games. That's like. It looks like that's where they've learned wrestling from instead of watching something that looks kind of like a fight. So uh, to answer it, what do I think about it? I think it's, it's just kind of an evolution that uh, unfortunately is probably here to stay. And as right. the older generation dies off, they're, you know, there's not going to be the, the people who are doing that stuff now. Think about the kids who are going to get into wrestling in five or six years. They right. don't know shit about right. Vern Gagne. They don't know jack shit about Jack Briscoe and Harley Race. Who are those people? You know what I mean? Right. So, uh, yeah, it, it's just, it's, wrestling has turned into something else. And whether it continues to exist in the long term, I don't know. Because, I mean, if you watch uh, fucking MMA, right? Does, right? Is there anything in MMA that looks like pro wrestling other than some of the ring entrances? No. None. No. You know, right. that that's kind of killed it off, I, I would think. And, and right. I think that's kind of hurt wrestling. Go on, Wolfie. You ready for mine? <laughs> yep. Yeah. <laughs> Telegraph wrestling moves, Wolfie. <laughs> so my take on that is, especially when you said the suicide dive, and I've seen so many of these things on, on uh, YouTube and Facebook and all this, the guys are fucking standing there looking up, waiting on this person to do whatever the fuck it is they're going to do. And half the time they miss them. Yeah, right. <laughs> so there, there is, I don't care what anybody says. There's still a formula that goes back years and it still works. And yes, it has progressed. And I feel that in my time, uh, what I signed up for back in 1989 was not the same as what even we did in TNA in 2004. I feel like I adapted, but I also the same formula. When I went to Mexico in 1994, I adapted to what they did and to what I did and made it my thing and still made it to where there's those certain things where I swear to God to this day, if I was to get in the ring, I could make people go, oh, that right there was, he was pissed off right there, or, ooh, that was real. I'm sure. sure. I guarantee I can do that because that's just, that's the formula that I learned. Um, like you said, it, it, it is kind of like a video game thing or like a movie. But the thing is, and, and when I was teaching my school, I used to tell the kids this. Yeah, you can do all these combinations of stuff. And, and, like, when you watch a movie and a fight scene, the camera's moving all over the place, and you can't really keep up with what's happening. In the middle of the ring, there's people surrounding you, and they have got to keep up with what you're doing or they're not going to follow it. They're slow. They're slow. The people that are watching this are slow. So you've got to make everything mean something. It's not what you're watching on TV. It's not what you're playing on a video game. You have to make it make sense. You have to make, when you get the oohs and the ahs or when they're not expecting it. Yeah, you can do a bazillion combinations of Mortal Kombat moves in the ring, which you see all the time, and they don't get the oohs and the ahs. It's because they're just kind of watching like, if that makes sense. 
But yeah, like if, like ping pong. Yeah, if you, yeah, right. and if you time it right and you set it up right, and when that big move happens and you sell it right, they're gonna go, woo. They're going Wolfie, to let, let me interrupt you here for a second. Speaking of our, uh, uh, this is to bring up our dearly departed friend, Bobby Eaton. Yeah. Uh, when you talk about like uh, dives and shit that wouldn't normally, you know, things that wouldn't, like nobody's going to jump off a bar onto you and do a fucking splash onto you in a bar fight, right? But I, I remember this, and stop me if I'm wrong, I seem to recall Bobby Eaton being really good about this. He'd be down and somebody would go to the top rope, jump off on him, Z-Man or whoever. But his timing was so good that he wouldn't just stand up like, oh, here, come and get me. One, two, yeah. three, four. His timing was so perfect that out the corner of his eye, his ass was still on the ground when the guy was taking off on the ropes, right. taking off the yeah. top rope. So when he turned around, I mean, that that's the artistry. It, was, it made it believable, like, oh, shit, he didn't see it coming, you know, which is what I think people don't get now. Exactly. Well, and, there, and there's so, you know, I had my wrestling school and then I also uh, taught the USWA school in 95, 96. And man, that was my biggest thing. And I had people that would come in there and try out that, man, they played college football. They did this, that, and the other. It's timing. It's footwork. It's believability. I don't care how strong you are and how athletic you are. What we do out there is something completely different. And and like you just said, it's those type of little things that make the difference, man. It's it's like you said, you know, turning around at the last moment, knowing what's coming, but not showing everyone that you know what's coming and that's that's just the that's the thing and and I swear I've seen it so many times uh lately on Facebook these motherfuckers are doing triple fucking flips off the top rope to the floor and there's like 10 guys standing on the floor looking up like okay here he comes yeah they're sitting there with their arms out like alligators waiting on the little alligator arms, as Tommy Dreamer used to call them, so they don't catch the guy and he hits the fucking concrete anyway. <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, how fucking stupid is that? You know? I mean, there's a, just a, and that's a, you know, the problem is people don't know how to sell. Because if you sold right and you had your timing, yeah. you would know it's coming down. Now I'm going to jump up. You know what I mean? Instead of standing there with your dick in your hand. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you for that. So really the last current affair, I've really enjoyed your recent appearances on Impact Wrestling, doing the marriage, also your, <laughs> your, 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 you know, your fun times that you just show up. And it's awesome because it's like you're a little Easter egg that just pops up randomly. And so when are we going to see you on Impact again? Soon, hopefully. Um, I'm not sure. Um, you know, I mean, I pop up. Do you remember the Flintstones show? Yeah. And do you remember the Great yeah. Gazoo? The great Gazoo. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I'm the great it. gazoo. I, 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 I pop up it. in this alternative universe. You know? <laughs> and again, if I you would have asked me 20 years ago to do some of the shit that, I did, that I've been doing, I would have said, are you out of your fucking mind? But, you know, right. again, if you're going to stay relevant, you got to blend in, you know? Um, so, yeah, I'm kind of the great gazoo. When they call me, I pop in and I do whatever. And, and you know, it's and, – and the thing that's weird, too, is, like, in the old days, the kind of promos I used to do where I would stand there and cut a presidential address kind of promo, right. those don't feel right anymore, if that makes sense. And the whole right. idea of even being a manager, because everybody knows there aren't real managers anymore, it feels weird. So I'm, I'm almost more comfortable doing that Lucha Underground kind of shit backstage because it's like, okay, now I'm just going to kind of try to play with acting. A little bit, you yeah. know. So a completely different, a different delivery than and tomorrow night at the Omni. Instead of that, it's more like, gee, Wolfie, what are you doing? You know, why would you do this, Wolfie? Uh, come, you know what I mean? Thank you for uh, coming on here and doing this. Uh, this has been great. Uh, and I also want to say, you know, just as uh, for my career, you've been a uh, uh, a main person that I would consider. Uh, someone that has helped me uh, to to be. Uh, I don't want to say the name that I've that I am or or what I, where the fuck I am. I don't know what I am, but uh, you you played a huge part in that, and uh, you you worked with me well. 
uh, you listen to me, I listen to you. I think we played well off of each other. And some of my greatest fucking memories of my career are what I did with you. And I just want to say thank you for that. And Wolfie, I feel exactly, I, I say this to you with a fucking tear in my eye, my friend. I feel the same way. And, and I, I appreciate the rub you gave me. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, you, 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 you elevated me because I was kind of floundering around before we hooked up and hooking up with you. Uh, you know, it was one of those things where it just uh, it raised my self-esteem and my confidence because I knew I was going out there with somebody who, who didn't look at me as a pain in the ass that was trying to steal their heat or whatnot. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and, and that helped me blossom because I mean, I didn't, as far I've always told people, I didn't really blossom as a performer until I was with the, uh, I mean, I had moments of brilliance here and there, but I didn't really blossom and know my shit until I hooked up, you know, with the fucking new church and we got that great run. So, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'd, I'd engrave your face on my tombstone if I could, uh, you know, <laughs> you're, you're part of my DNA wolf. Uh, and, and, and again, uh, Man, thank you so much for coming on there. This is, this is, you know, we've only been doing this for a few weeks now, and without a doubt, this has been the best one we've done yet. And uh, you got to come when back. we get down the road. I, I'd, I'd love to have you on again. Maybe we can talk about some more stuff. But man, uh, I, I swear to God, love you like a brother, and uh, thank you for uh, everything that uh, professionally you have helped me with and, and done for me. I, I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Uh, dude, ditto, ditto to you. So Wolfie and Father Jimmy, James. thank you so much for having me on. It's a fucking pleasure, man. Good to talk yeah, to you. Father Mitchell, uh, thank you for coming on. Tell, uh, tell the fans where they can find you on, on the social media. Oh, God, you're talking an old fart about social media. Um, well, I would say look up James Mitchell on Facebook, but there's a couple of fake ones. So if you look up the one that has me with a picture of the bald head <laughs> instead of the, the hair, uh, and it has a lot of shit about karaoke on it, that would be me. And if it has pictures okay. of a baby <laughs> and dogs on it, <laughs> that would be the shit. I, I think it's James Mitchell dot seven three one or something. If you had tried to look the actual thing up, um, okay. and on Twitter, I am, I believe it's at Minister Real. I believe my wife handles that stuff for me. Um, okay, but. I'm not that hard to find. Just, uh, and, you know, I, I need to get better at that. <laughs> so, uh, hey, Jimmy, uh, I don't know if you knew that, man. But, yeah, that's what that's what Jim does on the side, man. He's a karaoke guy on the weekends, man. Oh, that's amazing. Uh, well, speak and everything down there in Florida. Yeah, who, who wants amazing. a real job after you spent 30 years in wrestling? <laughs> nobody, nobody. My, my only other gig would be a televangelist. <laughs> <laughs> give your give your son a whirly bird from slash and uh i will talk to you soon man thank you so much all right be good my friends i'll see you thank you thank you sir. Good night. See and now a word from our sponsor Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Give Me Back My Pro Wrestling, the podcast that's based on the old school, but can still help you find the good stuff from today. Jimmy Street and the Plastic Sheik, Jared, are the undisputed tag team champions of the wrestling podcast world. From thought-provoking topics to superstar interviews to action figure expertise, this team does it all, and all they ask is, Give Me Back My Pro Wrestling! Every other Thursday, wherever you listen to podcasts. This is the big picture, Michael Jablonski. Don't forget to tune in every week to Jablonski's Pissed Off on the Give Me Back My Pro Wrestling YouTube channel. The fuck's wrong with this sport? He's gonna tell you all about it. He doesn't care what you think. You're gonna hear all about it. Mike Jablonski. In a world that has been completely divided for so long. 
two movie fans have decided to unite for the people and the betterment of mankind. One, an action movie buff. The other, a horror movie fanatic. Together, they will try to bridge the gap of both genres into one podcast with their battle cry. Give me back my action and horror movies. Listen along as Charlie and Nate alternate each week talking about action and horror movies they cherish, mostly from the VHS era. Also, including some modern examples that felt like the movies they grew up with by answering the battle cry. Give me back my action and horror movies. Available wherever you listen to podcasts. Look them up on Facebook and Instagram. If you're a pro wrestling fan, there's something for everyone at the Cheap Heat TV Podcast Network. From the Pro Wrestling Discussion Show, Cheap Heat TV Live, to the Interview Show, the Jackson Interaction Podcast with the king of all wrestling media, Gene Jackson, to the silliness of the Whitey Jenkins Show, and the brand new Zip, Xander's Irresistible Podcast with Charles Anders, you can check them all out and much more over at CheapHeatTVLive.com. So that was another great episode. Hey, Wolfie, tell them where they can find you on social media. Jimmy, they can find me in the club, bottle full of bub. I'm just kidding. Uh, they can find me on Facebook. Uh, my personal page is Warren Wolf, W-O-L-F-E. I'm on Instagram, at Warren Wolf 13. You can always find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube, at Live Wolfie D. Here's the thing. Wolfie always has offers for his autographed photos. He has a selection of some awesome photos from throughout his career that he will autograph and personalize any way that you want him to. Just contact him either directly at his personal Facebook page or through any one of our other pages, and we'll make sure you get in contact directly with Wolfie. Get those photos, right, Wolfie? Yeah, I've got some good stuff on there, you know, to help with the podcast. Folks, if you can't get out to a show to meet Wolfie D, there's nothing like that, especially for the fans of PG-13 and Wolfie D. And before we go, you can always find me, your host, Jimmy Street, at James Rock Street on Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. And hey, Jimmy, before we go real quick, I just want to add in there, uh, from the bottom of my heart, I really appreciate First of all, the work you've done for this podcast. You have worked your butt off. Secondly, the people that are liking the page. Beyond that, even more, is the people that are listening. And we really appreciate that. Yeah, and remember, guys, the podcast drops a new episode every Monday at noon. And our past episodes are streaming now on demand on all major podcast formats. Thanks again. I got a cat for you don't. He got a cat for you don't. I got a cat for you don't. He got a cat for you don't. He got a cat for you don't. And here we go. The original white boy that came out sagging, not bragging, don't be hating, cause I'm spitting the truth. Still loving in color. From Russia, mother, utilize a hubcap. I like any other. Back in the day, I was NOD, and I was P to the G plus the one and the three. In case you forgot, they call me Wolfie D. Been cloned and copied so many times. Title suck is taking credit for what is mine. You know who you are without me name dropping wrestling's first white boy coming out hip hop. Been doing it like this since 92. Late low for a while when you thought I was through. Listen real close to these rhymes that I've injected. This shit's so sick it makes your ears get infected. Mad skills, no faking, that is no one great. Cause I'm bringing more folks and over one for data. Not here to play games, so you better be right. You don't like me, so what? I really don't care. Like the time I keep ticking and I can't be stopped. You suck a step to the side unless you want to get dropped. When my finish, I'll straight knock you out. Please allow me to tell you what it's all about. Gonna wind it up. Then I'm driving it home, it's Wolfie D, baby. Huh, I got a cap for your dome. I got a cap for your dome. We got a cap for your dome. We got a cap for your dome. This has been a James Rock Street production.